Hey guys, welcome to the ninth video in the C Sharp Auto Updater tutorial series. In this video, we're going to be creating the Sharp Updater class. This is the last class that we have to implement. Sharp Updater is going to tie all of our other classes and forms together and provide the update support to the client application. So let's go ahead and get started. Go over to our project, right click on Sharp Update, add new class. And we're going to call this Sharp Updater. We're going to make this a public class because this is the only class that will be available to the client application. Next, let's go ahead and define the namespaces we'll need. So we're going to be using system, using system.componentModel. We're going to be using system.diagnostics. We're going to be using system.io. And we're going to be using system.windows.forms. Now let's set up the private fields that we're going to be using. First one's going to be a private iSharp updatable interface. And I'll just call this application info. And the other field we're going to have is a private background worker. And I'll call this BG worker. And this is going to be the background thread that checks for updates and checks for compatibility. Now let's set up our constructor. And we're going to have it a public constructor this time because this is the constructor that the client application is going to have to use. So it'll be a public sharp updater. And our constructor is going to have one parameter. It's going to be an iSharp update little interface. And we'll call this application info again. And inside here, what we want to do is assign our application info equal to that application info that we just passed it. Also, we're going to set up the background worker and register the event handlers. So the first one is this dot background worker equals new background worker, just, just to create the new object. And then we're going to do this dot background worker dot do work. And this is going to be the event handler for the do work method. And I'll make this a private. And the next one is going to be what happens after the background worker is done. So this dot background worker dot run worker completed plus equals. And I hit tab twice and it'll just insert that new one. I'm actually going to put this one below the do work method because I just like how they go in order. And we're going to make that private as well. Now that our constructor is done, I'm going to create the do update method. This is going to be the only public method for client applications to use, and it will start the background worker. So I'm going to put this right under the constructor, and it's going to be public void, because it's not going to return anything, but I'll call it do update. And it takes no arguments. All it does is check if the background worker is currently running, and if it's not, it will start the background worker. So it'll be if not this dot background worker is busy. And this if statement asks, is the background worker not busy? And if it's not busy, what we want to do is this dot background worker dot run worker async and we're going to pass it the application info. So that will start the background worker and pass it the R sharp updatable interface so we can have all the application info in the background worker. The next thing we're going to do is write the background worker do work method and in this method what it's going to do we're going to check if that XML file exists on the server our update XML and then if it does exist on the server, we're going to parse that and return a sharp update XML object containing all that information. So the first thing we want to do is get that application info, the iSharp updatable interface, from the argument. So we're going to make a new iSharp updatable variable and we'll call it application. And we're going to set that equal to, and we have to cast this as a iSharp updatable interface, e.argument. Because we pass that to the background worker right here, this is how you get it out. You just cast it as whatever you pass it and you can get that. The next thing we we'll want to do is check for the existence of that update XML on the server. We wrote that method in the sharp update XML class, so all we need to do is if not sharp update XML dot exists on server, and then what we need to do is pass it the URI, which is going to be application dot update XML location, and it'll return a true or false whether or not it exists on the server. So if it does not exist on the server, which we are checking for with a not operator, we want to set e dot cancel equal to true. And what this will do is when the background worker is done, it will have the cancel flag set to true so we can check that in the run worker completed method. Else, so that means if it does exist on the server, what we want to do is set e dot result, which will be the result passed to the run worker completed method, equal to sharp update XML dot parse. And then what we want to do is send that URI again, which is application dot update XML location. Then we want to pass it the app ID so we get the correct update information. And it's going to be application dot application ID. Since we already wrote the XML parsing code, we can now move on to the run worker completed method. We can get rid of this placeholder. First thing we want to do is check if it's canceled. If the XML does not exist on the server, because that'll be e dot canceled equals true. So if not e dot canceled, this will happen if it's not canceled. So if, it, if it's canceled because the file does not exist on the server, we won't do anything more. That's where it will end. But if it does exist on the server, we want to get that result. So what we want to do is set a new sharp update XML, and we'll call this the update equals, and then we have to cast e.result as a sharp update XML object. Sharp update XML cast e.result. Now that we have the object, we just want to make sure again that update is not null, because if it is null and we try to do anything on it, an error will be thrown. 
So we want to check if the update is not null, and we want to use the is newer than method we wrote in the sharp update XML class to make sure it is newer than the application you're currently running. So and update dot is newer than, and then what we want to do is get the current running application's version number. So we already have the this application info. So we can use the application assembly property and do a get name dot version, and that will pass the version to the method is newer than. So if this evaluates to true, what we want to do in here is create the new sharp update accept form, and that will ask the user, hey, do you want to accept the update? As you recall we created that in the last video tutorial. And you might also remember that depending on what the user selects, yes or no, it will return a dialog result, yes or no. So in here we'll put one more if statement, and it will be if, and then we'll create the new sharp update accept form. It's going to take two arguments. We're going to pass it this application info, and then we're going to pass it the update, because it asks for a sharp update XML, which is our update. And then after that we want to do dot show dialog, and this will pop up that window. And we'll also pass it this application info dot context. And that is just a reference to the parent window, so it'll pop up centered right on top of the other form. Then we want to see if that show dialog method returns dialog result dot yes. And if it does return yes, that means if it doesn't return no or abort, we want to do this dot download update, and we'll pass it the update. Now we haven't written this method yet, but this is actually going to be the next method we're going to write. To create the new method, just hover over download update, hover over that little box, and generate method stub for download update. Really quickly, I'll go over this method one more time. So if the background worker is not cancelled, we'll get the sharp update XML from the result of the background worker. Then we check to make sure it's not null, and make sure the update is newer than the current application. Because if it's the same or less than the current application, well, we don't have to update. Then we'll make the new form and show the dialog, and get that result if the user pressed yes or no, and if the user pressed yes, we're going to go download update. Now for the download update method, we're going to create a new sharp update download form, and that's the form we made a few videos back that actually downloads the update from the server. So we're going to do a sharp update download form, and I'll just call this form equals new sharp update download form, and we're going to pass it quite a few things. The first one is going to be update.yuri, which is the location to the update XML on the server. Then we're going to pass it update.md5, which is the MD5 sum of the file. And then we're going to pass it this.application info, the application icon. And that's just so the window looks like it's part of our client application. Then we're going to show that form and save the result into a dialog result called result. So dialog result, and I'll call this result, equals form.showdialog, and we also pass it this.applicationinfo.context, just so it'll be centered on top of the client application. Now we want to test the result. So the first one is going to be if result equals dialog result dot OK. As you recall from writing the sharp update download form, a result in OK means the file downloaded all right and the MD5 sum matched. So what we need to do is get the current path of this application that's running right now. So it's going to be a string current path equals this dot application info dot application assembly dot location. It actually returns the path to the current running application. And then we're going to get a string new path, and this is the path that we want our newly updated file to be at after we update the application. So we're going to use path dot get directory name and we're going to pass it current path plus, and we'll do the path separator plus update dot file name. And this is the file name in the update XML that we specified in the XML. Then what we want to do is call the update application method. We've not written this method yet, but we're going to write this after we finish the download update method. It's going to take four arguments. The first one is going to be form dot temp file path. And as you recall, that is the temporary file name of the downloaded update in the temp directory. The next one is going to be current path. That's the current path of the running application then the new path, and that's the new path we want it to be after it updates, and we're going to do update.launch.args, and these are the arguments that we're going to launch the updated application with. Then after that, we're just going to call application.exit, and this will completely close the application and allow it to update. Next, we want to check if the sharp update download form has been aborted by the user, so we're going to do else if result equals dialog result dot abort, but what we want to do is just message the user, so we'll do a message box dot show and you can just do some message to the user. So maybe the update download was canceled. And then on a new line, we'll do uh, this program has not been modified. Then we'll give it a little caption. Update download canceled. Message box buttons dot OK. And message box icon dot uh, information. Because I don't like the big error sound that comes when you do message box dot error. And then else, that would mean if the download failed, because it's not aborted and it's not OK. We'll just kind of do the same thing. I'll just copy and paste this. Maybe change the message a little bit. There was a problem downloading the update. Uh, please try again later. And then we'll just change this canceled to error. Now we can move on to the update application method, and this is the last method in this class. Hover over that box, generate method stub. I'm actually going to rename this string p to temp file path, and rename the string p underscore 2 to launch args. 
So to update the application, what we actually have to do is delete the current application, then move the temporary file into that location, and then rename it to the update's file name. And then after that, we need to start it with the launch arguments. For that, we're going to use a Windows process, and it's going to be quite long. It'll actually use five different Windows commands in one line separated by an AND. So we're going to create a new string, and I'll call this argument. And this is going to be a long argument, so make sure to pay attention. The first thing we want to do in the quotes is a slash c, which we're going to pass to the command command, and that'll allow us to pass a command to the cmd command, which is the command prompt. So the first one is going to be choice, which is a Windows command that asks for a yes or no. The first flag we're going to use is slash c, and that picks a choice, and it'll be yes, slash n, space, slash d, yes, and then slash t, and then a 4 afterwards. Now I'll very quickly go over what all these flags mean. The slash cy actually specifies the choice of the list we want to create. So choice makes a list of choosing yes, no, or whatever you specify it. So we want only one answer. This is actually a hack for a timeout. Basically, it'll pause for the amount of seconds we specify here. The slash n actually hides the choices from the command prompt. And the slash d specifies the default choice after the timeout, which is timeout right here, which is 4 seconds. So this basically pauses the argument for four seconds before it does anything to allow the application to quit before it gets updated. Then what we want to do is delete and we will force it and make it quiet so it doesn't show up in the command prompt. And what we want to do is escape and then put the first placeholder in there and escape another quote. So this will put that placeholder inside quotes. Then after that we want to do another and and we're going to do the exact same thing with the choice. So I'll just copy this over. But we're going to do it for two seconds instead of four this time. So once it deletes the original application we're going to move the update application into position. And we're going to do the slash one y argument which will automatically overwrite any other file that's named the same thing. And the first parameter that move needs is the file name that you want to move. So we're going to escape another quote here and put the second placeholder in, escape another quote, and then followed by the place where we want to move that file to. So we're going to escape quote again, put our third placeholder in, escape quote. And now that the file's moved in position, we want to start that file with the launch arguments that we specified before. And start's first parameter is the title that you specify for it to be started, but I'm just going to specify escape quote, escape quoting, and so it's just a blank title. And we're going to do slash d, and this is going to change to that directory before we launch it. So what we want to do is change to the directory of the new update. So what we're going to do is put the fourth placeholder in here, in quotes, followed by the file name that you want to start. So we're going to do another escape quote, put the fifth placeholder in there. Remember it's zero based, so the fifth placeholder is really four. And that will start that file name. And then what we want to do is pass the launch arguments. So we're just going to do the sixth placeholder right there. As I told you, it is a very long argument. So again, really quickly, this choice command, all the way up to here, pauses for four seconds before it deletes the original file, pauses for another two seconds, moves our temporary downloaded update file into position, and then starts it with the launch arguments. Now all we need to do is execute this command with the Windows process. We're going to create a new process start info, and I'll call this info equals new process start info. Then what we want to do is info.arguments equals, then we'll do string.format, and we're going to pass it the argument. And now we need to fill in those placeholders. So the first thing it asks for is what file are we going to delete? That's the first placeholder. So it's actually be current path, because that's the current path of the application running. Then what we want to do is move the temp file path, so I'll put temp file path, to the new path. Then for the start command, we want to change the directory to the current directory. So our fourth one will be path, dot get directory name and then we'll pass it new path which will get the directory name for the new file we just moved then what we want to do is start that new file so do path dot get file name and then we'll pass it new path as well and that will get the file name for the update and then we pass it the launch arguments then we're going to create info style equal to process window style dot hidden this will make it so the command prompt does not show up when it's running these commands also another way to do that is info dot create no window and set that equal to true and that just does exactly what it means it will not create a window and then info dot file name is the file that we're going to start. I'm actually going to set that equal to command.exe. And then the last thing we're going to do is process.start and pass it info. And that will start this entire line and execute it. Congratulations everybody, you have now successfully completed the Sharp Update Library. In the next video I will actually be going over the update XML that you will put on your server and show you how to put that on a server, followed by testing out the updater with our test application. Go ahead and hit the like button if you like this video, it really helps me out. Subscribe if you haven't yet, and I'll see you in the next tutorial.